Hello and welcome everyone. We are honored that you have chosen to be with us today. My name is Brad Burke and I'm the Enterprise Chief Engineering and Data Officer at American Family Insurance. And it's my privilege to host you to this very special event. Here at American Family, we believe communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's why we've created the Dream Bank, an inspirational community destination and virtual experience dedicated to supporting dreamers everywhere. At American Family, we are authentically committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, celebrating and activating these foundations of our mission, vision, and values in countless ways inside and outside of our walls. Today, in celebration of Pride Month, we are honored for the opportunity to welcome to the virtual stage, Rick Welts. Now, it is the virtual world and we are pre-recording. We do not currently know the outcome of the MPA finals. As we record, we're between game five and six, the Golden State Warriors lead three games to two. And during Rick's tenure as president of the Golden State Warriors, they did win three out of five championships. But everyone be quiet. All of you living in the future, please don't tell us and ruin the surprise. But uh, going on further with the introduction, uh, Rick is one of the most respected executives in sports, a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame and the first prominently openly gay executive in American sports. Rick's career spans 46 years in executive roles with three NBA teams and the NBA office in New York City. In May of 2011, in, front, in the front page story of the New York Times, Rick became the highest ranking executive in men's professional sports to publicly acknowledge he is gay. He has won numerous awards for positive impact and advocacy for diversity and inclusion in sports industry and beyond. Rick is here to share his personal story of finding his true self in the public eye and, and how it is not only helping encourage other, but also lead to a deep sense of authenticity that allowed him to be the best version of himself. So I would like you all to please welcome me and give me a warm welcome to Rick Welts. Thank you, Brad, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, and, and welcome to everybody who's, uh, who's watching us today. Uh, uh, part of the fun of this has been getting to learn about Dream Bank and uh, its mission and, and values. And uh, I'm, I'm tremendously impressed and proud to be a part of what you guys are doing here today. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes. We're gonna have an opportunity for, for Brad and I to have a conversation after that. But I'll, I just wanna kind of frame my story for you and hopefully I'll lead to a, to a great conversation after. Uh, I grew up in Seattle, Washington. I grew up in a, in a middle-class family in a wonderful neighborhood. I had a mother and father and, and a little sister. It was something kind of out of a uh, Norman Rockwell storybook. Um, my dad and I really bonded in our relationship through attending sporting events. I think I was going to University of Washington football games when I was three years old. And uh, that was when we communicated. That's when we had our good conversations. That's kind of what we did together. So my love of sports really started at a very early age. Uh, I went to Queen Anne High School uh, in Seattle. And uh, the one break that I guess changed my life was going to school with a, with a fellow student by the name of Earl Woodson. Now, Earl was the coolest kid at Queen Anne High School, and he was that because he was a ball boy uh, for the Seattle Supersonics, my, the brand new NBA team in Seattle that I had an absolute passion for. So instead of whatever we were supposed to be doing in English class, we were sitting in the back talking about uh, whatever he could tell me about what was going on with my favorite players and, and my favorite team. Earl came in one day with a very long face, and, and I said, well, dude, what's wrong? And he goes, well, my family's moving out of town. So trying to appear very upset, it was like, Earl, like you gotta take me down and introduce me to whoever hires those ball kids, the Sonics, which he did and I got the job. So uh, if it wasn't for that, it wasn't for Earl, uh, I wouldn't have had a 46 year career uh, in the NBA. Uh, I went to the University of Washington, didn't know you were allowed to go anywhere than your hometown to go to college. Uh, I wanted to be a journalist. I went to school during Watergate when believe it or not, journalists were heroes. Um, and I wanted to tell great stories. That's really what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but, but I was lucky enough to stay working part-time for the Sonics during college and then get hired full-time for, for my team 
uh, and then got my dream job there when I was 24 years old, heading media relations for the Sonics, uh, starting in the 1977-78 season. We actually, in my two years doing that, went to the NBA Finals both years and actually won the NBA Championship, Seattle's only NBA Championship in 1979. Through all that, um, I was certainly struggling with my secret. Uh, I pretty much throughout my whole life knew that I was different. And uh, it just really didn't add up to me with the things that I was interested in. And I was struggling, definitely couldn't reconcile kind of my love of, of sports uh, with how I felt uh, my sexual orientation was. And that conflict really uh, stayed with me for a great portion of my life. While I was working for the Sonics though, I met a young architect named Arnie Chen. And uh, we began what ended up being a, a 17 year relationship, certainly changed my life and my view of the world. Um, I ended up leaving the Sonics two weeks after we won the championship because it wasn't a real business then. We had 15 people uh, that ran the Sonics, uh, the equivalent of about what 900 people do at the uh, Golden State Warriors today. So we were either incredibly efficient then or the business has changed uh, a little bit since the 1970s. Um, when I left the Sonics, I joined a little sports marketing firm uh, in Seattle and was having a blast. I thought I'd be doing it forever in Seattle. And I came back, you, most of you are probably too young to remember when you would come back uh, to the office from lunch, we didn't have cell phones. So you had these little pink slips that said, while you were out and had a name and phone number on it. I didn't recognize the name, but I did recognize the phone number came from the NBA. Uh, so I called the number back. It was a lawyer who said he was the new uh, executive vice president of business and legal affairs and was trying to start a business operation at the NBA, which didn't exist at the time. So he asked me to fly back to New York. Our half hour meeting went for about uh, two hours. Um, and I couldn't believe it. A few months later, I was working uh, starting in July of 1982 at the NBA as the first person ever to go out and talk to corporations about investing marketing dollars in the NBA. True, absolutely true. Um, and it's really hard for you to understand what a damaged property the NBA was in those years. More talk about teams going out of business uh, than expansion, uh, widespread accusations of drug use amongst the players. Uh, it was a mess. And I came from Seattle where the NBA was king. So I, I had my work cut out for us. If I'd had a round trip ticket, I probably would have uh, taken it and gone back home because it was pretty tough. But my career there uh, spanned uh, 17 years. Um, and uh, it turned out that that young lawyer that hired me about a year later uh, was elected commissioner of the NBA, David Stern, in a job that he would hold for the next 30 years, arguably uh, uh, the greatest commissioner in the history of professional sports. And I reported to him all those 17 years and lived to tell about it. If you know his reputation, that actually uh, says something from my fortitude uh, right there. Uh, while I was at the NBA, um, I came up with the concept of All-Star Weekend, uh, adding a second day, adding a slam dunk contest, and eventually it was a three-point shooting contest. Um, I had an opportunity to be involved in the creation and marketing of the Dream Team, the 1992 US uh, men's basketball team, probably the greatest assemblage of uh, athletes on one team sport ever, the one the gold medal in Barcelona, and really, really changed basketball's fortunes around the world. It got to be a really uh, important part of the launch of the WA in 1997, which to this day is the longest standing professional women's sports league in, in which I have a lot of pride. But I still wasn't out uh, at the NBA. In New York City, it was easy. It was easy to be at the office during the day. And then you, when you're away from the office to have friends and family that uh, uh, knew everything about you and a great support system. Um, but it's also hard to explain to you what it was like if you weren't living then to be a, to be a gay man in New York City in, in the 1980s. It was a terrifying time. Uh, the New York Times just started using the acronym AIDS to describe this disease that nobody, nobody understood. Nobody knew what caused it. Nobody knew how to cure it. And, you know, if you were young, gay, and living in New York City at that time, you were probably like me. You, you, you lived each day just kind of hoping for the best. I, I kept a thermometer in my desk that I took my temperature every day. I would make, you know, deals with, with you know, my God to say if I could just have a few more years that I would, I would forever be grateful in, in having that. So it was, it was a crazy time. Um, and it came home to roost in my family. Um, 
on Arnie's 40th birthday, we went back to Seattle to celebrate with a lot of friends and family. And that same night, he spiked a really high fever. When we got back to New York, uh, he was diagnosed as being HIV positive. And uh, for the next three months, uh, was on a lot of experimental meds, never, never really was sick. In fact, one, one Saturday morning, he uh, got up to go play tennis. I went to the office. I came back uh, about noontime and found him like unresponsive uh, lying on the bed. A friend helped me get him to NYU Medical Center and he died five days later. And that's an experience that I had by myself in my work environment. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. Uh, I felt compelled to go into the office uh, and, and try to do my job as best I could over those few days. Uh, certainly something I wouldn't wish on anybody. It's kind of hard to imagine looking back how you get through that. Fast forward to about uh, 2010, I'd left the NBA. Uh, I always knew I'd want to get back to a team, uh, have a chance to win another championship. Uh, my dad had passed away. Uh, my mom had been diagnosed with lung cancer. I had at that time a, a 10 plus year relationship uh, that was also breaking up in large measure because I couldn't include the most important person in my life uh, in my work life. And I just came to the conclusion that, that I needed to change things. I needed to be able to bring my complete self to the office. But I, I had no idea how or, you know, how I should go about doing that. And I thought out a, a great friend in New York City that I'd worked with uh, for years, who was great in the media business. And we went out to dinner one night, feeling great in the movie, snowy night, Upper East Side. And I said uh, to Dan Cloris, uh, Dan, I, here's my story. I don't know how to put it in context with what's going on in the world. Um, I can either just come out to my, to my close friends at the office and that would accomplish what I wanna do or maybe there's something more here. And he, uh, he looked across the dinner table uh, at me and said, Ricky, he always still calls me Ricky. Uh, if you're prepared to do this, um, I wanna help. And I think it's page A1 of the New York Times. That's what I describe as kind of my holy shit moment. Like, okay. Um, I was inter he introduced me to another damn Dan Barry, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, reporter for the New York Times. He's still writing. If you ever see Dan's byline, be sure to read his stories. They're always amazing. Came out to Phoenix. We talked about how we would tell the story. And because I'd been pretty good at what I did and stayed out of trouble, nobody really knew who I was. Uh, you know, some guy in a suit at the executive offices of the NBA. Uh, but the people I'd interacted with my whole life, everybody knew. People, if you're a sports fan, people like Bill Russell, 11-time NBA champion, the Boston Celtics, still a dear friend. Two-time NBA MVP, Steve Nash, who was on our team in Phoenix, the commissioner of the NBA, David Stern, people like that. So I proceeded to go meet with each of them, ask them to talk to Dan. Uh, they all, of course, were very gracious in doing that. And in May of 20. 11, somehow there it was, a uh, front page story on the New York Times uh, that, that has been a blessing really in my life. It, it changed everything. Um, I, was, I, I will say I was the first executive in male team sports. I think women's team sports are way ahead of us uh, on this issue, but, but uh, here we are today over a decade later. And unfortunately that's still the case uh, that, uh, that no one else has chosen to take that step. But it did give me an amazing platform that I'll forever be uh, grateful for. Um, that same summer, I was introduced to the new owners of the Golden State Warriors. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to be selected president of the Warriors. And uh, the next 10 years was just a miraculous ride with, um, you know, as Brad was saying, six trips to the NBA Finals, uh, championships, uh, and the opportunity to build a state-of-the-art arena in San Francisco, which was definitely the hardest thing I have ever done. Uh, but it was my dream uh, to be part of a pro sports team organization. It's a dream I had since I was a kid. Um, that dream could never have included so many of the wonderful things that happened to me. I could never have been uh, crazy enough to dream about uh, somebody in a role like mine being inducted to the Basketball Hall of Fame in, in 2018. That's something that, that doesn't really happen. Or, or, you know, for all of us, the thrill of being asked by your alma mater, uh, the, for me, the University of Washington, to give the commencement address in front of 40,000 people uh, at Husky Stadium uh, in Seattle. Those, those kind of things no one could ever dream of, but it was because 
I chased my dream of working for a pro sports team. And, and along the way, uh, amazing things have happened. And I've been able to continue to use that platform uh, in an active way going forward. Um, you know, I, dreams can take you amazing places. And, and certainly I wish everybody on this call that you continue to have uh, nothing but success with the dreams that you have. So with that, maybe Brad and I can have a conversation. We absolutely can. It's interesting that sports marketing thing really took off. You know what I mean? <laughs> it did. It was a thing. <laughs> it really, it thing. It really, it's, it's amazing to hear where it all started. I also think the insight around AIDS and as a, as a tweener and a teenager in the 80s, um, living through all that as well as a gay man, um, it, it, it was an interesting time. And I think it stunted a lot of our growth in some way to kind of meet that challenge. So thank you for sharing and sorry for your loss. Um, and then sharing all your dreams. What I want to do now is just answer, ask some questions and we can just have a, a nice conversation for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, so I think, you know, you, you really touched on how you've kind of met your dreams. Um, so let's, let's move on to another topic, which is what, as you were coming out and you were talking to people, what was the best piece of advice you received or, or possibly wish you would have received before you had come out um, publicly? You know, I, I think it would have been, uh, don't pressure yourself. You'll know when it's your time. Like there is no right or wrong when it comes to each of our individual stories. Um, Things happen in our life that affect how we feel about who we are and how comfortable we are with who we are. And I don't think there's any magic formula. When, when I get calls today from people, which I do every week, I did earlier today, actually, from somebody in our industry who's not at that point yet where, where they want to come out. Um, I ask a lot of questions about how they're feeling and what, what they, they think the outcomes might be and what they're afraid of and what might be holding them back. And that's that's like the best I can do because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a, such, it's the most personal uh, of decisions and one that only they can make and, and should feel no pressure to do it until that moment when they know that taking that step uh, is something that's going to enrich their lives and, and give them a, a totally different feeling when they walk into work every day. Yes, I completely agree. As I've started up companies over my lifetime, it's always powerful to help people come out. Even today, you know, people still need Steed help coming out. Um, so you've, you talked a lot about the various aspects of your career. Um, what is a, a key skill or trait you, that you believe has contributed the most to your success? That's it's an, always an interesting question for me because I, th I think I had a secret advantage that being closeted uh, provides you because it, I think it gives you an extra level of sensitivity to all other people who face some form of discrimination. Um, you know, for whatever reason, people didn't know I was gay. You know, I, I, I wasn't putting on an act. I was always have been who I am, but I never, it one, never one time over my entire career did someone ask me uh, if I was gay. And that, that's probably because I erected those barriers that they um, expected or that they, they respected is what I should say. Um, so it, it's been a, it, it's a, it's a really interesting question because I do think it gave me an extra sensitivity, whether it was you know, where I saw gender discrimination or where I saw racial discrimination or religious discrimination, I think I, I had an empathy that others may not have had had they not been in a situation where there was something about yourself that, that you knew other people may not like. And, uh, you know, I, I think that made me a really good listener, uh, which I think is incredibly important. And I, I was blessed to be a pretty good communicator. So I think, I think that, that combination of being a good communicator uh, being able to really listen and understand how people feel, uh, but then being able to observe people in situations that were less than ideal in their works in their work environment, especially that had nothing to do with who they were, had everything to do with what they looked like or 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 who they worshipped. So I think I think those things created a, a super advantage for me uh, throughout my career. 100%. You really, you really do want to drive to let people live. Once you achieve your authentic self, you sort of want to help everyone else become their authentic self, right? 
Well said. Very well yeah. said. Yeah. Um, along, uh, along with an impressive resume, you've also won awards like the Glisten Respect Award and the United States Tennis Association's 2011 Icon Award for your advocacy for diversity and inclusion in the sports industry. Can you tell us about your passion was initially sparked in your work and how you've kept your drive for change and equality going? You just touched on a little bit, but give us some more. Yeah, no, it, it um, couldn't help but be at the forefront of my my thinking all the time, you know, like, because the fear of what might happen is really what held me back, that and the lack of a role model that I could look at. There's nobody out there I could look at and say, oh, wow, that person came out, that worked out really well for them and a similar role as I had, like, that's, that shouldn't, that, that encourages me. That, per, that didn't exist, you know, um, so, you know, I, I I, I think it, that that was my missing piece there. And I think it's what I always uh, thought about and and wanting to, one, to prove myself, first of all, uh, that I, you know, if people knew I was gay, they'd still like me because I still was accomplishing great things. And, you know, I, I think that that uh, drove me. And, and also, I think you just made a spectacular point. I, you know, the most important thing that I can do is help people succeed in their jobs, right? That's the thing I take the most pride in looking back is the people that have worked for me that have gone on to tremendous roles. And you you just hope that, you know, they there's something that they saw in you that they could take theirs. I know I had the greatest mentors ever in a series of bosses that I had. I'm not like any of them, but I do think uh, there's an aspect of each one of them that I was able to incorporate into the way I present myself and the way I lead. Uh, that that's invaluable and I wouldn't have had um, without that opportunity. I completely agree. I mean, uh, I am only in the IT profession, but one of my greatest honors is when someone exceeds my expectations as far as what they can do, something I, to help them grow and become something amazing, which I agree with you 100%. Yeah, it's, uh, for sure. It leaves you with a good feeling. Um, you know, everyone has their own definite success. And and you've obviously had lots of achievements, but what are some of your proudest achievements within your advocacy efforts, both specific to the sport industry and from the perspective of broader societal impact? Well, I, I just think, uh, you know, somebody just texted me a little while ago, um, you know, on CNBC is doing a whole pride series and I did an interview for CNBC and, and got, I guess, part of it aired today. Um, you know, just being able to, to represent, just being able to be out there and and, and hopefully present uh, an image to people, maybe in an industry that they wouldn't expect, uh, that that makes them feel uh, more connected to to somebody and 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 to people like me. Uh, and I and I and I take that uh, always. You know, it, it's always wonderful. I I do think. You know, while neither of them would admit it, uh, you know, being selected to be commencement speaker for the University of Washington, I think had some, a lot to do with my personal story. I think getting elected to the Hall of Fame was a recognition of my career, but also, you know, potentially the social implications of, of uh, my life as well. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I guess what I should say is I never expected to be celebrity grand marshal of the San Francisco Pride Parade. There you That's go. That's the best one. <laughs> I can I think tell that, you that was not on my dream list when I was a little kid growing up in Seattle. So, uh, you know, those are things you really remember and appreciate. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, 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 there is a lot that comes to representation, but you are a first mover, right? So you have to represent and lift people up. So um, it's amazing that you were the first mover advantage and, um, and the, all these different areas that you represent. Because as people say, it's, it's great to see yourself in someone. You know what I mean? It's great to, um, it, it really helps. Um, here at American Family, we celebrate Pride Month each June, but we always want to reiterate that we know it's not just a month, it's a year round effort and commitment. This year's Pride Month, the theme is progress. It highlights not only how far as an LGBTQIA plus community we have come, but also represents the continued efforts that we need to foster greater inclusion and representation as community. Tell us about your perspective and why ad advocacy remains imperative to this movement. Right, I think it's as important today, maybe more important today than it ever has been before, just because 
of the political atmosphere and the times uh, in which we live. Um, you know, my my uh, husband Todd and I got invited to uh, uh, attend uh, Barack Obama's final Pride celebration at the White House in his last year in office in uh, 2016. Uh, I'd only been there once before. It was for another cool occasion when the Warriors won the championship in 2015. But this was obviously a very different uh, kind of celebration, and uh, there were a few hundred people there. Um, the energy in the room was great. Uh, you know, during the Obama administration, so many amazing things that, frankly, none of us could have imagined took place uh, during his presidency, in, including, obviously, the uh, legalization of gay marriage. And uh, I think when people gathered there, they were expecting kind of a rally. They were kind of expecting, you know, this is a hurrah, good for us, look what we've done. His message could not have been uh, more different and, in retrospect, could not have been more profound. Because it was a very, it was a very somber tone that he had, and he, his whole point was, you know, let's let's take a lot of pride, uh, and let's celebrate the progress that has been made over the last eight years for him. Uh, but make no mistake, history just doesn't travel in one direction, and all the progress that has been achieved can disappear just as quickly as it happened. And I think, you know. It, it, actually, the timing of it was kind of remarkable. I think that was a Thursday, and that weekend was the Pulse nightclub massacre uh, in Florida, uh, which was obviously startling. But I, but I do think we're living in a in a time right now, even this last weekend, with some crazy stories, uh, where you know there's a political strategy here to marginalize uh, our community uh, for political benefit, and that that is something that wasn't imaginable in that White House uh, in 2016. That We thought that was behind us and it turns out it's not. And so, you know, I think we all have a responsibility to continue to talk about it, to continue to work toward equality across for everyone, right? Not, we're not just talking about our community, we're talking about across everyone. That's, that's what this country is supposed to stand for. That's what we as people are supposed to believe in and I believe in. So. Um, that work is not done. Unfortunately, that work is never going to be done. So the importance of that advocacy uh, today, I, I, I think, is just paramount. I really agree. I mean, I, I don't know how I felt. I've been with my partner for 22 years. I've been out for a long time. I kind of felt like I was in the food, fun and flags sort of version of, of pride. And, you know, recently I've really realized it is about advocacy. Like I need to jump back into it and mm -hmm be a positive force. We're not done. And if we're not careful, you know, one thing I always remember Obama saying, we got to do the work. You know, that was one of his phrases that would always say, and it, it really resonates with me these days that we have to do the work. We have to continue to advocate and raise people up. So completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, uh, in our work here at American Family, we uh, make an intentional effort to reframe challenges or obstacles as op opportunities. And as Openly out leaders, we are often, oftentimes called upon to represent the community we are part of, which can be both a great honor and a profound responsibility. It indicates that we have the ability to affect meaningful change with lasting impact. Um, what, is there a, a particular a story or an event that might show where you've really had to, to advocate um, in a tough situation? Uh, certainly the one that comes to mind first for me um, has to, is another NBA story. Um, the NBA had, uh, you know, awards a city uh, its all-star event uh, years in advance of when we do it. And, and the NBA had awarded uh, the city of Charlotte uh, the, the NBA all-star game. Uh, between that time that announcement was made uh, and before it was to take place, the, the state of North Carolina passed uh, some very discriminatory uh, legislation. Um, it, it was called the bathroom bill uh, because it was a, a requiring that people used the bathroom uh, that, uh, that was associated with their sex at birth. Um, and so, you know, it, it, the city, it was, it was an affront to Charlotte uh, purposefully by North Carolina because the state passed it because Charlotte had just passed some legislation that, that was exactly the opposite of that. And so it imposed on Charlotte 
uh, the repeal of that legislation. So the MBA was put in a very difficult spot. One of the things, you know, throughout my tenure at the MBA that really was, I think the heart of that started with David Stern in the 80s and has continued through Adam Silver uh, to today, is really a belief that sports has an opportunity to, to make a difference in the social discussions of our country. Um, people who don't think sports should have that part and we should just play games don't really understand the history of sports. It's, it's at the intersection of every uh, social conflict uh, historically. What, whatever happens gets played out in sports in a way that people focus on and care about. So the NBA had a dilemma. Could we go to Charlotte and, and, and say we're living up to the values we have as an organization, as a league? Or should we you know, pull the game away from Charlotte, which would be a very difficult decision. Our team in Charlotte is owned by the Michael Jordan, you know, perhaps the greatest basketball player ever played the first, you know, in a long time, the first black owner uh, of an NBA team. They've done everything right. They've, they've been great stewards in the community. They've, they've run their organization well, and it would be so devastating uh, to them to take it away. But the decision had to be made. So we, we gathered, actually it was in Las Vegas, I remember like yesterday, um, the NBA owners, it's called the Board of Governors, and they get together and, and discuss the business of the league and how to go forward. And Adam Silver, the commissioner, came over to me before the, uh, before the meeting started and said, listen, I'm, I'm, we're going to have this discussion, and I want to give you the last word. So, you know, he laid out uh, the dilemma Michael Jordan spoke, others spoke, um, but it was kind of uncertain what the league was going to do. And then he asked me to offer any thoughts I had. And what I could do uh, was just explain to the owners who were sitting around the table in the room, um, listen, I, I'm in touch with people at your uh, teams who have reached out to me because for whatever reason, in your organization, they're not yet comfortable with bringing their authentic self to work and they just want to reach out to somebody they could connect with who would understand. And uh, could say to the owners, I just want you to have that in your mind and know that those people uh, are going to be watching how you respond to this and how you, what you decide here. We'll say something about our league and we'll say something about, um, you know, who you are as a leader within our league. And at the end of the meeting, the, the owners decided not to stage the game in Charlotte. Um, I think, you know, I got my, my very first bear hug, first and only actually bear hug from Michael Jordan afterwards, who was very gracious and completely understanding and supportive of what we're going to do. It actually, it has a postscript too, which is happy. Um, that's that the state of North Carolina came under a huge amount of pressure because of what the NBA did and then what other sports entertainment entities did about not coming to North Carolina that the legislature made a decision to, to rescind and revise what they had put into place, which then did allow us to come back to Charlotte and actually make that weekend kind of a, a celebration of, of diversity for our league. So um, that's that's a role I never could have played or, or something that happened to me that never could have happened if I hadn't uh, taken that step to come bring my authentic self into work. I, that was such an amazing time I mean, first of all, that's an amazing story. I'm just trying to envision you. Like when you think of all the, the characters or the, in, the, the interesting personalities that own uh, professional uh, basketball teams, to be in a room of that mm -hmm. and uh, to be advocating the way you did, taking a risk, that's, that's, that's really impressive. But I will also say that like as a, a lay person outside of all this, watching the NBA take that stand a few years ago, it was really moving. And it had never, I mean... You know, I, I didn't understand the stance from a, a, you know, from a league like that. It was just, it was really moving. I mean, it really, it was really moving. And I think it started a bunch of advocacy beyond just that state. I think a number of, of different uh, situations were challenged. So to think you were in the middle of that, I, I appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that would be a very hard public speaking uh, <laughs> engagement. Um, that's kind of what uh, I signed up for. That's kind of what I signed up for, though. <laughs> that's true. That is true. That is true. <laughs> um, so, I, I, you know, we're, we're always uh, working on what's next. So can you tell us a little bit about the dreams you're currently pursuing? 
Oh, wow. It's a super exciting time. I, uh, I resigned from my full-time role with the, with the Warriors last July. Uh, and uh, I continue to give them bad advice they routinely ignore, however, uh, in a role as an advisor. But, um, you know, it's, it's been just amazing uh, how that time has filled in and things that you would, you would really, uh, you would really never ex expect. Um, I've been, you know, working with a investor who who thinks he wants to own a, an NBA team and trying to work with him and identifying a strategic investment that I'm hoping is about to be made in a team that he would really like to own someday and helping him understand how all that works and, and how the NBA uh, uh, functions in that regard. I, I, I still have a passion for Seattle, Washington, even though I left there when I was 25 years old. And, uh, you know, I, I, I still love that city. We had a just a crazy series of events that, that caused the Seattle Supersonics actually to, to move to Oklahoma City in a, in a not great moment for then Commissioner David Stern and, and our league. And the city deserves to have an NBA team again and has done a lot of things to prepare itself for that. So I'm asserting myself a little bit in that process. That way, I don't want to, I don't want to run another team. It is just would love, to, <laughs> sure, love sure. to love to be a part of bringing the Sonics back to uh, or bringing a Sonics team back to the city of Seattle. So that's great. Um, you know, I, it also gives me more time to do. I'm on a couple of public boards, but I'm also on a couple of uh, not-for-profit boards, and it gives you, you know, an opportunity to vote to devote your time to to good causes uh, as well, which I've enjoyed. And I, my, I've got you know another crazy project out there. It's actually, believe it or not, a movie project. What do I know about producing a movie? But uh, there is kind of a, a movie project out there that I'm uh, having conversations with and, and talking about. It's not about me. Uh, <laughs> well, we all like a little drama. So it should be fine with the movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just it's just fun. It's the first time in my working life I've had the opportunity to kind of entertain uh, some other opportunities. And, you know, end of the month, I'm on my way to Spain for a month, too, which is something I never could have imagined doing when I was a uh, full time employee for an NBA team. So I was just um, in Mallorca. I suggest highly to go to Mallorca. <laughs> okay. I, I like the soccer team there, too. It's owned yeah. by the only owner of the Phoenix Suns owns the Mallorca soccer team. I, I want to visit there. Do you know that that's uh, uh, Rafa Nadal's uh, tennis Oh, player. yes. My he sister is a huge fan. Made sure well. I, okay. I, I yeah. found this his home. Um, and I'm still <laughs> advocating for the uh, Dallas Stars to come back to Minnesota because that was my team. All right. <laughs> I understand yeah. losing. Uh, even though I know we have one already, but. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think the Sonics might happen before that happens. I hate to yeah. say that. <laughs> That's yeah. probably true. Um, but stepping back just a second, because leaving sort of your, I mean, because it was an ideal job being the president you were, what was it like sort of losing that identity a little bit as you stepped out of that job and went into, you know, sort of being the consultant? Yeah, it was, it's a, such a good question. And certainly the biggest question mark you have when you make a decision like that. I, you know, I've, uh, we, I, I hope everyone has kind of had to go through this. Knowing when to leave is as important as knowing when to get there, Right. Um, and I, you know, I'm not a guy who jumps jobs. I spent 10 years with the Sonics. I went to the NBA for 17 years. I went to the Phoenix Suns for 10 years, went to the Golden State Warriors for 10 years. So, uh, but each time there was a moment, I said, you know what? I think, number one, I think uh, my skill set for the job to be done, uh, my work here is kind of finished and I can continue to do this because it's cool but I'm not sure it'll be the same kind of challenge or the same kind of thing. I've always been drawn to opportunities that are, I think, high potential and very underperforming. Um, I know we could talk a lot about how each of those jobs fit into that, but the NBA fit into that, the Warriors fit into that. The Warriors hadn't made the playoffs in 16 out of 17 years. When I got there, that's in a league where more than half the teams make the playoffs every year. So really impossible to design how to be that unsuccessful. Um, so, you know, once you've kind of, you, you have this thing that was broken and it gets fixed and it's humming, to me, that's kind of when I lose a little bit of interest. I'm much, I'm much more drawn to the next challenge that I am to kind of maintaining success. Getting to that point is kind of what, I get excited about keeping at that point to me doesn't seem quite as interesting uh, or as hard or as challenging. So, I, you know, I think, I think that is also a really good thing to know when people are, are in jobs is, is, 
is when to leave and and feel good about that. But then you do wonder, like, you know, if anybody can return my email, right? Now that I don't have a at warriors.com uh, email. But address. Gmail doesn't count it. <laughs> yeah, Rick Welts at Gmail isn't quite the same thing. Uh, <laughs> And, it, and, and, and I, I think the jury's out on how I'm going to feel about it, Brad, if I want to be completely honest personally, because, you know, I've, I've been going to all the NBA, went to all the finals games, and I'm very much with all those people all the time. And I, I uh, you know, they put a little uh, medallion in the, in the ground at Chase Center as part of our walk of fame for my career. So it feels, I still feel very much a part of it. Um, but I, I'm a little worried about it. To be honest yeah. with you, to be you know, because it's not, it's, it'll be, it'll be different. It's not too different yet, but it will be different, and I'm going to miss parts of it. I think you make a, a great point, though. I mean, it's there are people who are builders and people who are nurturers, and sometimes when it becomes a nurturing position and you're a builder, it's time for you to sort of move on and build the next thing, and that, uh, that that's makes exactly, all this. that's exactly what I was trying to say. You said it better. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, but you extended out. See, if I was being interviewed, we would have been done like, you know, 20 minutes ago. That'd been bad. <laughs> um, so there's one question uh, that we like to ask everyone who comes and speaks um, to the Dream Bank. And um, so this will, this will kind of be our final question. Um, we know our audience listening and learning from you today is made up of fellow fearless dreamers. What advice do you have for anyone who's concerned who is currently pursuing their dream? Don't stop. You know, if, I think that uh, inevitably, if you're dreaming great things, uh, there are moments in time where it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Right? You're going to you're going to face a challenge or challenges that make it seem unrealistic to believe you can actually get where you want where you want to go. I, I am one of those lucky people that I wish for everybody that, you know, I, every day of my career, I woke up like so excited to go into work and not feeling like I was working just because I was, I loved what I did. And there, there is no substitute for that. The only people that I talk to who truly have career regrets are that they at some point in time had a chance to do something and they chose not to try. And nobody, nobody regrets shooting for their dream and not getting exactly that dream. But the people that don't try and always wonder, you know, what, what would it have been like? What would it have been like if I'd really been able to do that thing? And I, for whatever reason, my time of life, my family situation, my you know, other commitments didn't allow me to do that, or just, I got afraid. Um, it's a terrible thing to have to think about every day. You know, the regret of not having tried. There's no, you know, we've all failed and we all, we all hopefully fail on a regular basis, or so we're not tr we're not trying very hard. Um, but but to not try and not try to to see if you can do it, uh, to me is really the only regret you can have in a career. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, it's uh, grabbing success from the jaws of failure is a very very uh, exciting time, <laughs> you know. And um, I am, um, you know, you're. It's been just, it was great talking to you before we did this event and it's been great talking to you while we've been doing this event. I've learned a lot. Um, the fact that you were at the vanguard of, of media for sports. I mean, I realized in 1970s, they probably didn't have social media. So I'm not exactly sure what you were doing then. <laughs> but to think you were there introducing, you know, sort of the idea of branded sports marketing and, and what that has become, the juggernaut that that has become and the amount of careers that that has created. And then um coming out and having your successful career and being your authentic self i mean it's just straight such a great story for us as dreamers it's the kind of authenticity that we strive for here at american family so i just really appreciate your time and i really appreciate yeah. you taking the risk to tell your story thank you very much thanks brad I, I just have been so impressed with all my interactions with american family and dream bank it's just you know it's so wonderful to see an organization stand for for something so important as helping people like realize their dreams and you know giving giving them a lot of help along the way. So congrats to American Family and you know again I wish for everybody you know, who's participated and listened on our conversation here today uh, nothing but success and and keep dreaming. To stay in touch with Dream Bank's events, programs, and online offerings that are designed with your dream in mind. 
Visit us at ampam.com forward slash dream big and connect with us on our social channels. To highlight another excellent upcoming opportunity for us to come together, we'll be hosting the second round of our popular Dream Bank Dream Academy course, Making Time for It Matters. Through this enlightening five-week course, you'll identify your biggest time sealers, choose your top priorities, redesign your daily schedule, and make intentional changes to how you use technology to support your productivity and well-being. We invite you to scan the QR code on the screen to learn more and to register to join us for this impactful experience. To all of you who tuned in and spent this time with us, we thank you. On behalf of American Family Insurance Dream Bank, we look forward to hosting you again soon. Until then, keep dreaming fearlessly.